Hello, in this part of the course, we're going to be moving into a new section, which is machine learning. Um, there's a lot of material we're going to cover, uh, but at the same time, it's really uh, the tip of the iceberg for all the material you can do in this field. Um, let me try to start by relating to something that we're familiar with, um, and then connect it to something new we're going to be doing, which is building models. So all of you have been running functions for a long time, right? So, hey, maybe I'll write this code, and then our function take inputs, maybe in the form of parameters. And then they have some outputs. Maybe I mean they're printing something or, or I might return a value. And so, for example, I can imagine that um, a function could be doing something like making some sort of prediction. Maybe my input is that I have some details about a house that's for sale. And then I might be predicting um, what it might sell for. And so when I have a function like this, that's an example of a model. And, um, and I could imagine having it feed in a bunch of values at the same time and making a bunch of predictions. So the idea of machine learning is that instead of having a computer write these, or instead of having a human write these functions, we're going to have a computer um, automatically generate these functions. And the way they're going to do that is they're going to learn by example. So we'll feed in a bunch of training data where we have um, a bunch of different houses that have sold for different amounts and have different bedrooms and baths. We're going to try to infer things like, well, how much is a bedroom worth? How much is a bath worth? Um, how, how useful is it to have a newer house? And then based on that function, we're going, to be able to, um, we're going to be able to generate that function and then use that to make predictions on other um, data. And you can imagine why that might be useful for a lot of things. Maybe you're doing property assessments or uh, maybe you're a realtor and you're trying to figure out how to pr price a house properly. So the example I've given here is an, is, um, an example of a regression model. Um, and, uh, and a regression model is kind of more broadly a type of supervised machine learning. Um, which is one of the main three categories of machine learning. So I'm going to start broad now and talk about these three areas, and then we're going to be talking about regression in more detail, and I'll actually explain um, what it is. So the three main areas of machine learning are reinforcement learning, um, which is basically a situation where you have to make a series of decisions, and you're trying to optimize some sort of reward. So you can imagine some sort of robot moving around in the world and picking up coins or something like that. Um, we're not going to be doing that kind of, um, of work in, in this class. Instead, we're going to focus on two um, areas, which are supervised machine learning and uh, unsupervised machine learning. And in both of these cases, we just have all our data up front, and we're trying to um, gain information about that. Um, some people will say there's a fourth category of um, machine learning called super semi, uh, super, super semi-supervised, um, but we won't be talking about that here. Um, within supervised machine learning, there are two different um, things that we're going to learn this semester. One is regression, and, and with regression, um, we're trying to predict a quantity. And then with the classification, we're going to try to predict a category. So in any of these cases where we're trying to predict something, um, that's known as a supervised problem. And, um, and the way it works is while the data we have has some labels on it, usually there's some special column that's telling us you know, a quantity, like the price for a house or some sort of category. And then from that, we can try to predict that label in cases where the label is unknown. In unsupervised learning, there is no special um, label column that we're trying to predict. We're just trying to look for general patterns in the data. And so we might do a couple things. One, we might try to cluster our data where we're placing rows into different groups. Or we might de try to decompose our rows. We might notice that um, you know, I might have these rows which each, each have five numbers in them. Uh, but maybe um, every row is like a combination of kind of two component rows. And so there's some simplicity in there, even though there might be a lot of columns in our data. So I'm going to go through these four types of things that we're going to learn this semester and, and just try to make it uh, more concrete. So here I have a table, right? This is just a regular data frame. And so this is my index here. Um, here are my column names. Um, right now I have a Y column, which is my label. So that's going to be generally what I'm trying to predict. And then I have these different um, columns here that, uh, that I, I guess I'm just calling them x0 through x4, but usually those would have some sort of real name, right? Like before I saw that we have like the number of beds in a house. Um, so this label that we're trying to predict is what we're going to try to do is look for a relationship between that and these other columns, which we're going to call features. And so in general, what will happen is that we have some examples, some rows where we have examples of both. And then there might be some other um, data where we only have the features, but we don't have um, the Y label. And so we want to try to uh, predict what should go in here. And, and you can imagine why that might be. Maybe these are all different um, houses, and some of them have already sold, so we know what they sold for. And then these have not gone on the market yet, so we're trying to predict, well, what would they sell for um, if they do go on the market? Right. So the, the problem here with regression, I just want to state again, is that we want to predict a quantity the Y column in this case, based on the features, right? And by a quantity, I mean, this is like a number. 
Um, so how are we going to do that? Well, uh, we might actually break it down into three parts. First, we might um, select a subset of the data that we, um, for which we know the answer. And then we might leave some other data aside for which we also know the answer. And what we'll do is we'll run an algorithm that is able to infer what the relationship is uh, between these features and these labels. Once I've done that, I might run my model on these other ones for which I also know the answer. Now, of course, I already know the real answer. And um, unless my model is perfect, it's probably going to give me somewhat different answers. And so why would I do this? Why would I want to make a prediction if I already know the answer? And the reason is that I can do this to evaluate my uh, model, or, or I might say test my model. Um, so for example, if my model says that um, this row should have been 70 and it's actually 72, well, that's an error. Same thing here, 60 versus 59, that's an error. And I can try to quantify all of these errors and then give my model some sort of um, score, right? That's the testing phase. So after that, after I've learned my model up here and then I've kind of evaluated it on some known cases, then I might actually put it um, in production. Production means I'm using it for real things and I'm trying to predict actual um, unknowns in the world. Um, like for example, if I add a new house to the market, what, what might it sell for? And I could try to put these different values there. Um, another thing we might do uh, even beyond making predictions is that I might look at that model and just try to learn things about the world. Um, so I keep going back to the example where we're selling houses. Um, I think it's interesting to just know, well, for each additional house or for each additional bedroom or bathroom I have in my house, um, how much does that increase the value of my house? And I could use that to make different decisions, right? Like maybe um, I want to do a housing remodel. Um, am I going to get more benefit by adding another bathroom or, or another uh, bedroom? Right, so we, we can just kind of learn things about the world and also make decisions in that way. Okay, so all this was regression, which was um, the first kind of supervised learning uh, we're going to learn this semester. Um, and when we're doing um, these regressions, right, the key thing that makes the regression is that we're trying to predict some quantity in our Y label. Now, it's totally possible that our features might be a mix of both quantities and categories, right? So something like green, red, blue is a category. Something like shape is a category. A lot of things that are strings are categories. Um, that's fine, right? The distinguishing characteristic of a regression is that the, the label column is quantitative. If I somehow am working on a problem where my Y is categorical, then this is no longer a regression. It's a classification um, problem. But otherwise, all these other things I've been talking about where I, I kind of do training and testing and then I put in production, all of that is the same. We're just dealing with categories instead of, um, um, instead of quantities. Okay, so moving on, we saw the two kinds of, um, of supervised learning, which is both um, regression and, and classification. What about unsupervised learning? Um, the main thing here, the main point is that there is no uh, label column, right? I just have a bunch of features. And, um, and then I can try to still learn some patterns about this, even though I'm not trying to predict anything. And, and so one of the things I might want to learn is, well, are there any sort of natural groupings of these rows? And so there are algorithms out there that will, um, let's say, put all these rows into three groups, and it might assign them numbers like 0, um, 1, and, and 2, right? And then just to kind of draw what that looks like, well, all of these rows um, belong together. Now, I really want to stress here that there is no data out there that tells me what the proper grouping is or even how many groups there are. Um, so when I'm doing this, it's not exactly like there's one right answer. Um, but that doesn't mean that all groupings or classifications are equal. Um, I can measure within a group how similar um, those rows are to each other if I have some metric for that. And so then my goal is to have a grouping that uh, kind of maximizes the similarity within each group. And there might be different um, groupings that are equally good, right? But as long as I'm kind of having a high similarity within groups, well, then I still learn something um, meaningful. And you can imagine lots of different reasons I might do this. Like maybe each of these um, things uh, represent a different user um, for my web application. And if I can say, hey, well, there's these 10 different kinds of um, web users for my application, I could maybe run a different uh, marketing campaign um, for each of these different groups. Okay, so clustering again is unsupervised. It's unsupervised because while well, there was no label column I'm trying to predict. Uh, the last kind of machine learning problem we're going to talk about this semester, and uh, which is probably the most complicated, is called a, a decomposition. And, and decomposition is also unsupervised, is again, right, there's no column I'm trying to predict here. And the idea with the decomposition is that I'm going to look through all these rows 
and see if there's any pattern. Are there kind of a, a, a couple archetype rows that, that really can be mixed together to create other things? So, so maybe what I see is that um, with some small error, most of these rows are just combinations of these three um, rows over here, and I would call these my component rows. So you notice the columns are the same, right, between my original data and my component rows. And then to get this row here, like negative 11, negative 7, 3, 20, 20, um, what I would do is I would multiply this row by negative 11, and then add it to 21 times this row, and then add it to negative 8 times this row, all right? So I'm kind of taking a weighted average of these three rows um, to produce this, this row. And if you actually crunch these numbers, you'd see that I would do something kind of similar to this, but um, there would be some error, right? It's not a perfect match, which is um, which is fine. I mean, the fewer components I have, well, then I can have a simpler model, but while well, there might be more error. Um, so, so I have that here, right? I have these numbers here. And what we'll generally do when I'm trying to mix these components to create a row is I'll put these numbers in another table um, down here. Um, so this will be a table of all my weights or maybe my principal component um, uh, scores. And so I'll put, you know, negative 11 here, 21 here, and then negative 8 here. And then for this next row down here, right, I'll do the same thing. I'll say a negative 43 here, 12 here, and then the negative 6 here. And, and so since I'm doing this, I'm putting kind of these mixtures for every row down here, down here. What that means is that um, if there's um, n rows over here, then there are also going to be n rows over here. If there are um, m columns over here, well, then there would be m columns over over here. So basically what I can do is I can take this big table and I can uh, reduce it to having some components here and I can have some weights here. It's useful for lots of things. Um, one is just if I'm trying to uh, uh, save space on my on my storage system, right, it, I can have these things be smaller. Uh, but then it's also nice if I'm trying to do other phases of machine learning, like a classification or regression, it's kind of nice if I only have like three feature columns instead of the original five that's trying to help me in, in a number of cases. Okay, so that's a whirlwind tour of these four problems we're going to solve, regression, classification. Those are both supervised because, again, it's labeled clustering, decomposition. There is no column we're trying to predict, so that's unlabeled. It's unsupervised um, learning. And, um, and so for each of these four things, there's actually a ton of different um, algorithms out there. And, uh, and in this semester, we only really have time to learn like one algorithm for each of them. And so if I go to this website down here, this is the website for scikit-learn, which is the module we're going to be learning. And, um, and there's probably close to hundreds of different um, algorithms or different classes they have there. I put a small subset under here. And, and so I can see, well, here's all these different things they have for clustering. And we're going to just learn one of those, which is k-mean, k-means clustering. Decomposition, all these different things I can do, we're going to learn just one of them, which is PCA. Um, it turns out that for a lot of um, algorithms, the uh, the classification and regression come in pairs. So for example, here I have like a decision tree classifier. Here I have a decision tree regress regressor. Here I have a k-neighbors classifier. Here I have a uh, k-neighbors regressor. And that's why I didn't uh, try to split these out. I just put both of these under under these two categories. And so we're going to learn two things here. We're going to learn logistic um, regression. And we're going to learn linear regression. And this is a little bit confusing because, well, this part's obvious, right? The linear regression is trying to be a, a regression here. This is the one that people get confused on because even though it says regression in the name, it is not a regression. It's actually a classification, right? So these are the four things we're going to be learning this semester. And logistic regression is one people always get confused on because, well, it's not actually a regression. And I think once we learn all these things, the very nice thing is that um, the interface to using the other ones is relatively simple. So for example, once you know how to use a linear regression, um, you could very easily just replace the word linear regression with ridge, and, um, and you're still going to be able to do all your machine learning stuff uh, correctly. Now, before you do that, you should probably learn about how ridge works and then think about which model is best for you. But at least in terms of the code, it's very simple to switch between different models um, within any, any of these four categories. So I want to talk a little bit, that was pretty high level, I want to talk a little bit about the foundations where I need to um, be learning this machine learning, both in terms of the code and then also the math. Um, we're going to learn a few different modules. The, the main one is at scikit-learn. Um, I was just showing some documentation from scikit-learn. 
Um, we're also going to learn NumPy, which has um, lets us deal with matrices. It turns out that NumPy, um, uh, NumPy is uh, really the foundation for pandas, right? All all pandas data is actually stored in NumPy, and uh, and now will be a good time for us to actually see that. Um, and then we're going to learn this thing called PyTorch, and, and PyTorch um, can do a couple of things for us. One is it can do calculus for us, which is pretty cool. Um, another thing it can let us do is it can actually let us run our code on uh, GPUs, which are graphics processing units. Um, everything we've been running so far this semester has been running on CPUs, right, your central processing unit. And, um, and it turns out that GPUs that are originally built for graphics are also happen to be really good at machine learning. And so a lot of things, if you're dealing with a lot of data or kind of complex models, a GPU will be better at it. We're going to have to learn a little bit of math. I'm not assuming you have any uh, math background be, besides what you might learn in, in high school. Um, but let me give you an example of how math is going to come into play here um, for a regression problem. right? So we have this example again with all the houses and these characteristics. And then we have a function that predicts the, the price. Um, how would we do that with matrices? Well, I might take all these numbers in a data frame and, and put them in this matrix here. And then for my function, I may have um, kind of just an algebraic expression, which is using matrices. So my x here is this matrix, um, c is a vector, uh, b is just a number. And when I run this, well, I'm going to get these other, this other vector out here, which actually has all the, all the prices, right? So to understand what's going on here, uh, we have to learn a little bit of linear algebra, right? This is not a regular multiplication. It's actually something called the, the dot product, and it looks like this, right? I can take this um, x matrix here, uh, dot product it with this vector and then add a number and then that's how I'm going to get my my results over here on the right hand side to do one prediction right and what's cool right is that if I can do one row times um, times this vector here and I get um, one house value and it's just going to go through um, kind of without having a loop even right the beauty of linear algebra and multiplying matrices together with the dot product is that I can do it in one step and I'm going to get actually all of these numbers the code for it is pretty simple. Um, if I say data frame dot values, then um, x is actually going to be um, a NumPy array. And if I want to, I can just say, well, I want the dot product of these two things, and I want to add b, and, and it just works. So we're going to be talking about that in quite a bit more detail um, at some point before the end of the semester. Um, one thing I want to note is that if you're reading other documentation, um, a lot of resources will use A instead of X, which I find confusing. I think that's not intuitive if you're kind of you know working in all of these scikit-learn modules because those will generally use X for data. And then even stranger, right? We'll often have a C when we're in scikit-learn, but then they call that little X instead. So just be, you know, as we're learning linear algebra stuff, I just want to say up front, and I'll say it again, uh, be aware that the variable names are a little bit wacky. Um, so what is kind of the scope of linear algebra and what kind of things are we trying to solve? Well, one thing that we're not going to solve is something like this, y equals x squared. That is not linear, right? Anything quadratic or cubic or anything like that, uh, um, not linear. Really, all we can do is multiply, um, uh, multiply variables by numbers and then add things up, right? So this is an example of a, of a linear equation, right? I just have, um, uh, I have some different variables, right? And then I'm, I'm multiplying them by different numbers. One of the things we're going to notice is that um, the way we're going to be doing linear algebra in this course is we actually have very big matrices and, and a lot of variables and a lot of equations, right? So you can see here I actually have 50 um, variables. So I think the key takeaway is that um, more variables, more data, but simpler equations. Uh, what about calculus? So, so here I have that situation again with the house where I have some training data. So I have both my features and my label. It goes into an algorithm, and that algorithm will basically spit out this... Um, this formula for me that I can use to predict housing prices, right? Now, it turns out that um, when I was doing this training, right, I had the original prices, and the new prices might be a little bit different, right? This is 140, this is 190, 240, 254, right? They're all a little bit different. And, and so what I can do is for this given um, equation I end up with, I can have some sort of function called a loss function that compares the correct answer with my model's answers, right? So I, I compare these two and I get one number out, right? That's kind of like what my error is or how bad it is. And um, and of course, how bad it is really depends on, on kind of the numbers that are part of this equation 
um, down here. So the whole idea of this training thing with this algorithm is that I want to find out, well, what C can I do that is going to make um, my error, my loss, um, as small as possible, right? So we're trying to minimize something. And um, and I don't expect you've taken calculus, but I know a lot of you have. And in calculus, we're often trying to minimize or maximize things. And, uh, and that's why it's trying to come into play a little bit here. The good news is that we don't have to understand calculus. There's going to be um, modules that can do it um, for us, such as this PyTorch thing that we're going to be learning. Um, PyTorch is also going to help us um, uh, be able to run our code on, on GPUs. We're going to be able to do things like take two matrices, um, shove them over to a GPU, and then multiply them together. And um, it'll just kind of it almost feel like it's just magically going faster than it would if we're running on a, on a CPU. Um, and it doesn't take a lot of code to um, to move it around. So PyTorch is going to be very powerful, both in terms of calculus and using uh, GPUs. Um, to conclude this um, video, I just want to talk about this difference between um, developers and users and, and then who, who we are. Um, when I'm looking at this picture here, right, I'm feeding all this training data into a machine learning algorithm, and then that's giving us a function we can use to make predictions. Um, there are classes, and I guess people um, in general, who um, either develop new algorithms or, or write code and optimize code for existing algorithms. And we'll just do a tiny bit of that, but that's not our focus. We aren't trying to um, do machine learning research or come up with novel ideas. Um, we aren't developers. Instead, we're going to be users of machine learning algorithms that come in scikit-learn. And, and so some of the questions that we're going to be interested in going forward for the rest of this class is, well, um, which algorithm uh, should we use in sklearn? Um, how should we pick it? And, and I guess, how should we configure it? Right, A lot of these have different parameters. Um, in terms of the data, how can we clean it up so it's trying to work well with the machine learning algorithm we chose? And then finally, when we actually use this thing, we're going to get all these predictions that we can compare it back to the original. And how do we want to score that? There's not necessarily one right way um, to evaluate how good or bad it is. And so we want to get some experience with that as well. So that's a bit of a preview about um, what's uh, coming up um, in the course, and, and hopefully this is kind of a fun uh, change of, of pace compared to what we've been doing.